Great to have you here. First story, the Registrar of Companies has been appointed by an Accra High Court as the official liquidator of the Ghana Football Association, GFA. The Registrar General, Jemima Owari, is to take custody of all assets of the Ghana Football Association to prevent officials of the football governing body from dissipating them. The court presided over by Justice Samuel Isiedu has also placed an injunction on all officials of the football governing body from holding themselves as such. This follows an application by the Attorney General for the injunction following the expiration of a 10-day restraining order granted by the same court. Deputy Attorney General Gottfried Yabua Dami, in moving the application, said the GFA was being used for illegal purposes, hence the responsibility of government to protect the interest of the public. He further added that officials of the GFA have used the association for some scandalous and corrupt activities. Lawyers for the GFA, led by Thadio Sori, opposed the application. Mr. Sori told the court no member of the association had been found guilty by any court of competent jurisdiction for committing a crime. He questioned why the Attorney General was not interested in initiating criminal proceedings against the officials of the GFA captured in the documentary by investigative journalist Nasa Awanas, as had been done in the past. He maintained the relief the AG was seeking was not appropriately put before court as the members and officials of the GFA had not been individually served with the application. Godfrey Abouadami replied, lawyer, sorry, that the law allows that once the director of the company had been served, the company had been notified. Justice Samuel Isidro in his ruling said, the case against the GFA is not frivolous. He said the AG stands to suffer the more and cannot be compensated in the event the application is refused, but the AG wins the substantive case. Deputy AG Godfrey Yabwadami told pressmen they are awaiting conclusion of criminal investigations by the police to commence prosecution against some officers of the Football Association. Joseph Akablay spoke to Deputy Attorney General Godfrey Yabwadami. Well, I think the registrar of companies has been mandated by the court to take control of all the assets of the GFA, and that's a regular step in the process of liquidation of any company at all. Even in a private company, totally private company, which does not perform any objects which essentially can be described as public, when liquidation proceedings are commenced, the court has the power to make an order appointing the registrar of company to exercise the powers of a liquidator pending the determination of the petition for the so essentially what it implies is the Registrar General is mandated to take control of the GFA, not really to manage it, but to exercise control over the assets and to ensure that there is unnecessary disposal of the assets or um, interference with any relevant things in relation to the GFA. The court made a reference to some seven days, if you could clarify that for us. The seven days is for the Attorney General to execute an undertaking. The rules of court require that when an injunction is to be granted by the court, the court can exercise the discretion to uh, ensure that undertaking is issued by the person in whose favor the injunction has been granted. And in this case, the injunction was granted in favor of the state. So the court will just be fair in circumstances. So the Attorney General or an officer that Attorney General will mandate should execute an undertaking to ensure that in the event that um, I'm just uh, taking to ensure that the proper thing is done in circumstances. What's the way forward for the AG's department in terms of the quest to have the GFA liquidated? Yeah, so we continue with the, with the, with the processes for the liquidation. Um, today sets a very remarkable tone in the whole process. The court has appointed the um, registered companies to exercise their powers under the liquidation act. And, and, and to me, it's very significant. It, it, it shows that, well, very serious issues have been raised before the court. And, um, the assets of the GFA can be safeguarded from any unnecessary dissipation. The concern by the lawyer for the GFA is that, I mean, it's in this unusual instance, you are not uh, prosecuting as you've done in other investigations that a journalist has carried out. Uh, are we to understand that you are doing something or you are simply not prosecuting? No, no, not at all. I mean, but you see, but he loses the point. The point is that in the course of this civil action that we have um, filed, we can actually 
take steps to ensure the allegations of crime are, are dealt with by the court. So the court has the power to consider the allegations of crime that we have made against the GFA, even in these proceedings. The allegations of crime can be established within the premises of this action. So I think that he has missed the point entirely. But are you, are you undertaking some criminal investigation hoping to pursue? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Criminal investigations indeed have been um, undertaken. We see and other executive committee members report to the Ghana Police Service all the time. They are still conducting their own investigations. So I don't think it is appropriate for uh, us to say that no criminal action whatsoever will be taken against them. So, so, so with the uh, register of companies taking over the assets of the GFA, how does the two-man interim committee function? Well, as I said, the reason why company's power now is not to manage GFA, uh, not to run the daily affairs of the GFA. It is to ensure that the assets of the GFA are not unnecessarily dissipated or disposed of. So that one day we cannot say that one of the members of the GFA who are on the books of the rest of companies act as the lawful owners of the GFA who go ahead and dispose of the assets. Essentially, they have been restrained from disposing of the, of the assets. So the rest of the companies is to ensure that those assets are preserved and managed until the suit has been um, disposed of. And if the suit is determined in the favor of government, yes, of course, then the rest of the companies will take the office steps to then dispose of the assets in accordance with law. Away from the GFA and legal issues, it's been four months since John Yusuf Latif Idris was brutalized by police. Now he's been left with a fractured skull after policemen attacked him in front of the CID headquarters when Deputy National Democratic Congress, the NDC's General Secretary, Koku Anyidoho, was arrested in March this year. The Ghana Police Service is still having difficulty naming and shaming the officers who assaulted Latif Idris. Is it a deliberate effort to shield their men, or our safety is not as paramount to them as theirs. While well, some colleagues of Latif, including I, call for the truth. The media are your eyes and ears. Anybody who attacks the media is blinding you and deafening you to everything that happens around you. Our purpose is to keep you informed, and anybody who attacks us does not want you to be informed. The police is supposed to protect us and keep us safe from all the people we fear. So if we live in a country where the people we fear the most are the police, then you can understand what an upside down republic this is. Latif Idris is one of the best of us. He was on duty doing his job. For you, the police decided that he was a punching bag. They punched, kicked, and hit him with rifle butts. They fractured his skull. Four months down the line, he is still suffering the physical effects of the beating they meted out to him that day. Are you okay with this? He was working for you. Are you okay with this? To me, as a journalist, I feel insulted. I feel disrespected. It had been four months, and they are still giving excuses after excuses after excuses. What are they telling us? We hear of so many cases where police personnel are attacked by so many people in different places, and within a day or two, they get the culprits, punish them. So if after four months, they are telling us that they are yet to identify whoever attacked Latif and to save justice, I think it's very unfair and it's very insulting. They say we are partners together in service to the nation. If, if they really respect us as journalists and what we do, then they should accord us that respect and serve us justice. We need justice for Latif. I remember years back when my recorder was seized at the passport office while I was doing a story. It took the then Deputy Information Minister, Baba Jamal, to get me my recorder back. I was held somewhere. And I was also released after his call. That for me was even traumatizing, even though I wasn't beaten. So imagine how Latif is feeling by now, being beaten in the line of duty. This shouldn't happen. It shouldn't happen at all in Ghana, in this era. Press freedom. No, this shouldn't happen. Those who did that to Latif must be fetched out. It is possible. So we are urging the Ghana Police Service, fetch those people out. Justice for Latif now. Well, the United Press for Development Network, a coalition seeking justice for Ghanaian journalists, has asked the police service to, quote, stop talking and bring out your men 
who brutalized Latifi Juisu in court, will have given the police service a one-week ultimatum. If IJP Asantia Pietu can't find out, investigate, somebody who's a forensic investigation to give us clearer picture of what really happened and bring out his men, then we will tell his boss that he's incompetent and he must be removed. Hmm. Um, so the, you've given them seven more days. Yes. Okay, but yes. you you gave an initial thirty days. We gave an which initial thirty days. Which was long enough. You've added seven Too days. What, long. what what is it really that you want to do? You see, the information minister Al Haji Mustafa Hamid was busy himself around with the expose of Anas and a couple of their the activities, the New Patriotic Party's activities, uh, and all of that. We called Madam Emilia, who happens to be uh, his secretary at the Ministry of Information, several times trying to book an appointment with. With, with the minister, when we presented the petition, he gave us a, a five minute standing meeting that he would, he would, he would uh, basically give us so a hearing. So you've met him? We met him on the day of the petition, that is 28th of May. And since, he has no time for us, till now. But what do you want him, as information minister, to do for you? Well, you see, when we talk of media, at least the, the Ministry of Information will oversee our activities and we liaise with them essentially so we're trying to call his attention to what's happening so he can we stipulated about four or five things we needed him to leave for us i think the general public including the security and politician do not understand our work so we needed a deliberate effort to educate Ghanaians and to call for a good collaboration between the media and the and the, and the police or the security officer it's amazing one of our, our network members in takrade was abused by a, a, a military man on, on, on the Hadia Fati day, I think a day after the Hadia Fati incident. So this is too intriguing. And the Media Foundation for West Africa reportedly, reportedly say about uh, 20 people back, uh, 20 journalists within 18 months. Probably five is even too much, mm. five. And mind you, we have been credited as uh, 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 Africa's uh, number one country in terms of press freedom. Mm. And the whole world is watching us. And IGP as Antia Pietu is here messing things up. And we are quiet. I can promise you, for us, Coalition, uh, Press for Justice Coalition, and the United Press for Development, and Think Twice Foundation, we won't shut up. Mm. We would push to our last drop of blood mm. falls. So after seven days, what happens if you don't hear from the police? We'll organize a press conference and we would start or we'll attempt. We'll first basically petition the president that this is what we have been going through for the past three months. We've heard nothing from uh, his inspector general of police or our inspector general. Oh, you, you did hear from him. There was, uh, there was a briefing yesterday. It, it, the, this briefing is too malicious. We can't even, I, I, I don't want to even cite my mind to that. Like I said, you should tell that to the dogs. Even children wouldn't listen. Children won't listen. So we'll petition his assistant, the first gentleman, then we'll tell him, we'll show him that his IGP is incompetent. We need him removed. We have witnessed party in opposition, their media relation. The MPP has been in opposition for eight years. Mm. And we know, I've been in this for about 15 years now, and I've witnessed NDC and MPP being in power in opposition, and we know their media relation. We've witnessed NDC in power under His Excellency John Dramani Mahama and Sandobe smashing camera and all of that. We spoke against it. We are not for any party, trust me. Well, we won't rest until justice is served away from that veteran politician joseph henry mensa aged 89 has died jh mensa a gold coaster born in october 1928 as a founding member of the governing new patriotic party and served in three different ministerial positions under the john ajikum kufu administration president kufado has been to the late jh mensa's house the president spoke in a local dialect <laughs> They are to me, are to me. Come here, pa. Nina, Yankopo. This is a head. To one extent, it's a real opinion of bread, you know. I feel terminal. My hospital, I'm a head of bread, you know. See, let me do it for the baby on Yankopo and Wayana. Nimbi, I have a friend, so I'm ready to say, no medicine at home. Now, all colors, you know. Only Dinichi may come be papa. Jabana Banis, Ghana Kunakesi, and Susano, Ghana Bidre, Minamitiswa, 
I said, me be be strong, and the shed in the May so. And me buy a massam or one. The president there speaking in Chi saying that he would do something to honor the late judgments away from that government has announced the opening of the University of Ghana Medical Center UGMC as hospitals overflow with critically ill patients sparking a national conversation about the nation's emergency health care system. The health minister who announced the opening after a familiarization tour of the facility Wednesday evening said the UGMC will however only take referral outpatient department cases from the 18th of July 2018. That's more on the following report. Government announced the opening of the University of Ghana Medical Center after persistent outrage over the abandonment of the $217 million facility. Over a year since the John Mahama administration commissioned the first phase of the facility, the current government is yet to open it to the public, citing technical reasons. But a media engagement on Wednesday evening, managers of the facility revealed they will finally begin the operationalization of the outpatient department, but not for walking patients. It will only be available to refer out OPD cases with limited specialist services to three main departments, dermatology, ophthalmology, and ENT services. Laboratory and pharmacy services are also expected to be available. The facility will start off with about 30 to 40 staff approved by the Ministry of Health. Government says it will need at least two to three weeks to begin recruitment of staff to other unused facilities, after which they will be made operational. Cabinet has already approved $50 million for the second phase of the center. Parts of that money is expected to be used to procure drugs and non-drug consumables as well as secure reliable power supply for the facility the board of governors for the office of the special prosecutor have been sworn in the governing body include the special prosecutor Martin Amidu the deputy special prosecutor Cynthia Lamte representative of the audit service a diary representative of the police service director of police CID Mamit Tiwa Adudankwa and a representative of the Economic and Organized Crime Office, Charles Nana Entry. Also, there's a representative of the Financial Intelligence Center, Kofi Buedi Buache, a rep of the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, Charles Ayamdo, Minister Responsible for National Security, Kweku Domfe, and the female representative of the Anti Corruption Civil Society Organizations, Linda Ofori Kwafo. <laughs> That I will at all times, well and truly serve the Republic of Ghana, well and truly serve the Republic of Ghana, in the office of, in the office of, member of the Office of Special Prosecutor, and that I will uphold, and that I will uphold, preserve, preserve, protect. Protect and defend, and defend the, Constitution the Constitution of the Republic of Ghana as by law established. The Constitution of the Republic of Ghana as by law established. So help me God. So help me God. I am holding the office of holding the office of Doing the name of your almighty God swear. I will not directly or indirectly. Communicate or reveal to any person. Communicate or reveal to any person. Any matter which shall be brought under my consideration. Any matter which shall be brought under my consideration. Or shall come to my knowledge. Or shall come to my knowledge. In the discharge of my official duties. In the discharge of my official duties. Except as may be required. Except as may be required for the discharge of my official duty, for the discharge of my official duty, or as may be specially permitted by law, or as may be specially permitted by law, so help me God. So help me God. We're gathered here to enable me to perform the final act in the establishment of this office. 
is required by the dictates of the Special Prosecutors Act, 20, Act, 2, Act 915 of 2017. And in so doing, now the office is fully functional according to law. The establishment of the office has caught the imagination and uh, elicited the overwhelming support of the Ghanaian people. There's a great deal of expectation as to how this office is going to function. The composition of the board, in my view, tells us two things. Firstly, your purpose, the fundamental purpose, is to work to ensure the independence of this office. But it is extremely important that the commitment that was made that this would be an office independent of the executive, that is the charge that you are required to keep. But in so doing, your own composition tells you that you have also to be the body that ensures the cooperation of the law enforcement agencies of this country. So the responsibility is on you to ensure that the public life of our country is sanitized, are considerable. But I'm confident that the quality of people that have been assembled on this board beginning, of course, with the special prosecutor himself and his deputy and the other members of the board, are such as to give confidence that this very difficult assignment is one that is going to be undertaken in all seriousness, will be done without fear or favor, ill will or malice. John Hughes' hotline documentary, Rampage and Soldiers, has been adjudged the best broadcast video story for the year 2017 by the International Federation of Greek Journalists, IFAJ, at its annual awards ceremony in the Netherlands. Joseph Apokugapo, who produced the piece, was last night handed the IFAJ Star Prize Award at the Federation's annual congress. It was his second award for the night after he was also honored, along with nine other journalists, with the Young Leaders in a Greek Journalism Award by the Federation, the judges described Joseph's work engaging and the story effectively told. Joseph Gakpo from Ghana is the winner of this category for his Rampaging Soldiers video. Now the judges said that this important story was engaging, effectively told, and commended Joseph for his production values and strong storytelling. They also pointed out that some of the world's best video storytelling now appears to be coming from the African continent. So, Joseph, congratulations, and come up and accept <laughs> This is, this is outstanding because Joseph was competing against um, some journalists from other organisations in other countries who are arguably much better equipped and have lots more resources at their disposal. But Joseph, in 2018, my friend, you are the best in the world. Joseph had this to say after he picked up the award. I must admit I'm super excited. Um, this documentary we did, Rampaging Soldiers, um, that got everyone talking how Fulham Iwam invasion had um, destroyed a lot of farms, farmers had run into debt, there were food security challenges in a lot of these communities. Um, the issue became topical in Parliament, the minister got someone eventually. Um, we virtually poured all that we had into putting together this piece, a lot of sleepless nights, um, um, you know, we had to visit virtually every region in the country to put together this particular documentary. And right here at the International Federation of Agrarian Journalists Congress, um, it's been awarded as the best video piece um, in the world, virtually, from several nominations that came in. I'm super excited. And um, I, 
I, I would right away dedicate this to all the everyday farmers whose stories we told in this particular piece who complain about how they've been impacted by this Folami worm invasion. And um, we are all looking forward to um, all the necessary measures that will be taken to avoid a recurrence of such invasion and the destruction of farm fields. Um, as the conversation continues, more relief will get to them. Some definite measures will be taken to stop the further destruction of these Folami worms. Wish him all the best. Now, President Okufado has assured he will soon forward recommendations of the Commission of Inquiry into the creation of new regions to the Electoral Commission after studying it. He said this will enable the EC conduct referendums in affected areas to pave the way for the creation of the new regions in accordance with the Constitution. He was speaking at the Deborah of Chiefs and people of the Oti Enclave in Dubai during the final day of his tour of the Volta region. The president received a resounding welcome at Jasikan with residents chanting Oti O Oti and holding placards displaying achievements of the government. At a Deba in Dambai, the Krachiwura Nana Mpra Bisimuna commended government for granting their over five decade old request for the territorial split of the Volta region. He assured a hundred percent vote in the referendum for the new region. He appealed for the provision of portable water and construction of tarred roads. We the Chinese and all Addressing the people, President Okufwada noted that the potential of the area is a determinant in creating the OT region. I'm encouraged, Katsura, by your commitment, your target of 100%. Almighty God, let him bless us all, and that the 100% will be realized. I say bless us all because I support the demand of the OT region for the creation of new regions. I believe that it is being done not to spite anybody, not to reject anybody, not to turn our back on anybody, but in order to promote better governance of the area, I see the development of the Oti region as an opportunity to strengthen the bonds between the people of the South and the people of the North, not as a basis for people coming apart, but on the contrary, to be able to enhance the cooperation and the friendship. Now, potholes can be considered the greatest nuisance on Ghana's roads. They have and continue to cause many accidents, but scientists are optimistic the problem will soon come to an end. The scientists at the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, Building and Road Research Institute, have been able to code aggregates with waste plastic, which they believe holds the answer. On Tech Thursday, Lava from Squissy Deborah has been speaking with the lead scientist, Dr. Ahmad Tabo of the Build, Building and Road Research Institute. All roads are constructed to avoid water accumulation. For example, a well-built street or highway has a slight crown in the middle, which channels water to the sides. But water is very stubborn. It finds a way in and under pavement. Traffic wear and tear due to extreme heat and sunlight can result in cracks. Once there's an opening, water sifts into pavement. In warmer climates, cracks caused by heat wear away the surface 
resulting in air gaps in the pavement. As vehicles pass over these gaps, the top layer sinks, collapses and crumbles. A pothole is formed. Dr. Amatabo. We are having a lot of rainfall these days. We are having a lot of sunshine these days. So because of that, the binding material, which is conventional bitumen, is not able to withstand all these changes. So elsewhere, not even only in Ghana, elsewhere, they modified the bitumen to make it stronger and they make it more durable to be able to withstand all these conditions. The Building and Road Research Institute and IS Modification of Bitumen for Road Construction Initiative decided to add value to waste plastic. We have seen that there's a lot of challenge with the disposal of plastic waste. Plastic waste is either dumped in the landfill or it is washed into the sea or it is haphazardly littered around. Now, this caused a lot of problem for us. If it's littered around, what you see is that people just collect it and burn it, and it releases a lot of toxic gas into the environment. So, as researchers and being in the construction industry, we thought that using this in the construction industry, using the waste plastic in the, uh, in the construction industry, we will be adding value to waste plastic and we'll be turning waste into a resource. The scientists therefore used two types of waste plastic, HDPE and PET, to cut the aggregates. So when we get this, we melt the plastic, we don't burn it, because if you burn it, it's going to release toxic gases into the atmosphere. So we melt it, and when we melt it, we coat aggregates with it. And after coating aggregates with it, we mix it with bitumen, and we use it in the construction of road. But currently, we are still working on the coating. We have tried several percentages. We have tried 5%, we have tried 8%, we have tried 10%. And we realize that the 5% coats very well. This is followed by the 10% and then the 15%. The initial laboratory test found the plastic coated aggregates had performed the conventional aggregates. In the area of binding property, in the area of other properties, they do far, far better than the conventional aggregates. Reporter for Joy News, Kwesi Debra. Ball gown, fairy tale, fitted bodies, flares, trumpet skirt, mermaid skirt. A-line skirt and flared skirts are among the most opted from the different types of wedding gowns. Now, how much does it cost? And what goes into the choice of a dress? Also, pre-wedding photo shoots have become a must-do element of modern weddings. Max Olagbagba has been speaking to a photographer and a wedding gown retailer at the Accra International Conference Center, the venue for the Joy Bridal Fair. We have uh, um, a lot of discount going out for our customers. Since we are in the fair, we are part. We've been we've been here for several times, okay. so there's a lot of discount that we are going to give to our clients who will join us here. Okay. Yes. What about weddings? How much do you charge for weddings? Are you able to tell us? Yeah, we have a package, so sometimes it depends. Let me give you a, a rough estimate here. Maybe depending, you, you give you the format. So at the end of the day, maybe it's going to be up to maybe 3,500. But you can decide to choose some options that you wouldn't like and which will definitely come down. And at the end of the day, you still get some discount in addition to the one that will be taken out. Especially in the peak of wedding times, when you come in, we, we give a lot of good discount to our clients. Now let's get closer to um, the lady who um, is in charge of the wedding gowns here. One of the people in charge of the wedding gowns. Let's find out how much it will cost a wedding gown for my would-be um, wife. Let's find out from them here. Hello, you're welcome to join. Hello, thank you. Great. Um, Aketesia Brides. Okay. So Aketesia Brides, tell me, wedding gowns, right? Yes. We do wedding gowns, bridal makeup, and then bridal accessories too. Goes into uh, the option, like the choice of a wedding gown for um, women who come to you, would-be brides who come to you. What really goes into their choice? Well, I think that for every bride, they need to look at their personalities. Some brides are down to earth, fun, some are fun. So you look at all that 
that and you incorporate that into your dress. Um, and then for choosing a wedding dress, you need to look at the cut of the dress, your body, figure and all. So we are bridal when you come over to our shop, we assist you in helping you choose a gown that is just for your personality. Interesting. So, uh, for I mean, a lot of brides, sometimes the um, you know the they would have to make the wedding gown after it's done. You know, sometimes some people just keep it in their bags. Yeah. What, what advice would you give to I mean, for the brides after the wedding? What should they use the I mean, the gown for? Well, some brides not really concerned about what gowns they choose and after what they will use it for. So who is really concerned about not keeping your dress after that? You need to choose a dress that you can use after the ceremony. We have so many dresses which are simple at the bottom that you can use for that. And also there are also many websites that you can resell your dresses okay. now. So. So so would be brides can actually i mean brides can actually take advantage of that after their wedding yes. they can put up their wedding gowns on a yes. website yes there are a lot of websites that resell gowns ebay even does that oh really yes. this is news to me <laughs> yes <laughs> okay. because some dresses are really expensive and so they do resale of it and then they just sell it to other people that might want it for a cheaper price of course oh, okay. yeah. wow. So how much do these gowns go for? Are you able to tell us the price? Well, now I can give you a like a lower figure from starting from a thousand five. But for how far it can go, it depends on your details and all. Okay. Yes. So, so it can go really, really high, depending on the details and so what designer you are choosing. So the highest can be like how much? I can't give you a, a ballpark figure okay. for that because if you're choosing a very, like a really high designer, it can go as much as 10,000 Ghana CD. And it can, I mean, depending on where you're getting the dress. From us, there's a, it starts from 1,005. But if you come to us and you want a dress, we take your measurements and everything. You tell us the designer you want. We can order for you and then we give you an estimate. Do make a date from today, the 12th of July, to the 15th of July on Sunday at the Accra International Conference Center. This year's edition of the Joy of Beauty and Bridal Fair promises to be a really, really exciting one.